Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the new year, January 5th. We're coming to you live from our studio in Brainerd, where it feels like mid-September. It's hard to believe. And don't turn your channel, because this is not a program about politics or caucuses. It's something a lot more interesting than that. Our program tonight is Saving a Place to Dance for the Firebird. And if you're not familiar with what the Firebird is, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, because it's a fascinating bird. And if you look at the screen, you can see it. The Firebird is... The uh, sharp-tailed grouse, and I think when most of us think of grouse in Minnesota, we think of rough grouse, but tonight we're going to talk about the sharp-tailed grouse. But before we get into that, I'd like to introduce my guest this evening, who is Jody Provost, who is a uh, wildlife habitat developer of the sharp-tailed grouse. Welcome to the show, Jody. Thank you, Ray. Glad to be here. And tell us, who do you work for and what is it that you actually do? Um, I work for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, um, Division of Fish and Wildlife, as a private land habitat specialist, um, my focus is assisting landowners with brushless projects in northern Minnesota. And I think when, at least for myself, when I think of grouse in Minnesota, and I've always thought there was a, a tier across the northern part where there's sharp tail, I, I honestly never realized they were so close to central Minnesota. And it's because of the habitat. It takes a, a special kind of habitat to have them here. Mm -hmm. But in, in your particular line of work, um, how do you find people to work with? Um, it's actually pretty easy. I have people that contact me that hear about what I do and, and say, Jody, can you come out and see my land? Can you help me with a project for sharp tails? Um, and also, I do target places, too. We have certain areas where we really want to, to work um, and do habitat projects for the birds, particularly around their dancing grounds. And so often I will contact folks and see if they're interested. So when you... Uh you say habitat, I think probably most of us think of them as being in the woods, but that's really not their best habitat, is it? Right. No, um, in Minnesota, we have four, four grouse that occur here regularly, and they each have their own sort of niche, sort of job that they do, and sharptails really use that habitat in between grasslands and forests. We call them kind of the in-between bird besides the firebirds, another nickname for them. Rough grouse like deciduous forests. Um, spruce grouse like the coniferous forest and prairie chickens like prairies and grasslands. But sharp tail really need that in between grass and forest, that mix. When I first saw some of the pictures that you had, I, I thought of the uh, prairie chicken because, it, especially when the males are going through their ritual, mm -hmm. they do have some similarities to a prairie chicken. And I would guess that if someone didn't know the differences, they would get them mixed up sometimes. Is that possible? Yep, they could do that. You know, they're both birds of open habitats. Um, and they both do a display on a dancing ground um, that you call a lek. Um, but they are different in, uh, in their habitats. Prairie chickens prefer more of the very wide open grasslands. Um, and they're different too um, in, in their, the way they look. Uh, sharp tails, as their name says, they have a very sharp pointed tail. Prairie chickens have more of a fan rounded tail. Um, the air sacs on the males when they display are different colors too. And they have slightly different displays. Um, well, you're leading into this clip that we have. It's a phenomenal clip. It's about a one-minute clip showing the sharp-tailed uh, dance. And pay attention to the colors of these birds. It's absolutely fabulous. So if we could take a look at that clip, this will show our viewers what we're talking about.
is not that neat? Uh, if you didn't get that, some of those are uh, were puns, but it's really <laughs> well done, and uh, they are a magnificent bird to watch. And I would guess that most people don't get the opportunity to see that dance very often. Right, many people don't. There's, in fact, there's people that um, have birds, you know, dancing around very near where they live or grew up, and, and they still haven't seen it. So. Um, I really like that sort of movie trailer that was put together, um, that was put together by one of our wildlife managers, Bo Liddell. And it's, um, I think it really captures what you can experience when you're out there watching the birds. And hopefully it will intrigue people enough to actually go out and sit in a blind and watch the birds some spring. We do have places around the state where people can uh, reserve a morning in a blind. Oh, really? So we you have blinds set up strategically around? Yep. What parts of the state do you have those? Um... Last year we had six locations um, that DNR folks were in charge of. We'll likely have them in the same places again. Uh, if you're around the Baudet, Bemidji, Lake Bronson State Park, uh, Cambridge, Aiken, or Cloquet offices, DNR offices, you can contact them. And you can contact them usually starting like about after March 1st. The peak dancing time is in April. And so you can make your reservation for a morning in April. Uh, you will need to get there. 45 minutes to an hour before sunrise, and then you sit in the blind for two to three hours after sunrise and enjoy the birds dancing. Take binoculars, warm clothes, um, a camera, a lot of good photography opportunities. Um, and not only do you get to enjoy the sharp tiles, but you also get to see a lot of other wildlife at the same time. Uh, in fact, last spring, for example, my son and I were out in the sharp tail blind near Palisade, and we got to watch a peregrine falcon swoop down and try to take a sharp tail. So, Get to, get to see a lot of interesting things. Wow, that's really interesting. Now, you work in the Aiken area. Is that where you, you know, mainly spend your time? I work out of the Aiken DNR office, but my work area has actually been all of northeastern Minnesota, so it's taken me to several counties. And within those areas, um, counties, we do have what we call op or priority open landscapes where we really want to focus our sharp tail work. So I generally work mostly in Aiken, Carleton, and part of St. Louis County. And what's the range of these birds? Um, the statewide range of the birds, uh, we have population in northwest Minnesota and east central Minnesota. Um, okay. It's right here, you can see it now, yes. At one time, sharp tailed grouse were found across most of Minnesota in suitable habitats. Um, but over the last several decades, their, their range has shrunk to what you see there to northwestern, east central Minnesota because that's where there's still suitable open habitat for them. So do they need a, co a combination of open habitat but also trees, woods for uh, safety? Or is, is the open area probably the best for them? Well, they do need some woody vegetation, and that's why they're kind of that in-between bird. Um, but they don't need large contiguous forests like like a rough grouse. So would. what we're looking at here is, is, is pretty yes. ideal? Yes, this is a very nice brushland complex north of Cromwell that we manage for, for sharp-tailed grouse and other brushland wildlife. It's a big prescribed burn unit and that shows really nicely there just the scattered amount of brush and trees that, sh that you need. You mostly want it open, just scattered willow, scattered alder, scattered birch, aspen, they do like that woody vegetation. They're, they're browsers, so they like the, the catkins, the twiggins, the buds, um, in addition to their other food sources. If uh, wild turkeys are introduced in the area, are they competitors for their same kind of food or not? Um, there's really not, at least at the Minnesota, not a whole lot of areas where they overlap, and I don't think there would be competition. No, their, their habitat needs and behaviors is different. And how about when these birds are mating? Do they make sounds that you can hear? Um, yeah, yeah. Like on the, the the movie trailer that you saw, you really didn't get to hear the sounds. But if you go to a blind, you will hear a lot of neat sounds. They stomp their feet, rattle their tail feathers. They'll be cooing and hooting. Um, one of my favorite sounds is the clucking, sort of chuckling the noise they make when you flush them. So they're very vocal birds. So they obviously we've lost some of them over the development of our. Our, our areas, mm -hmm. um, and how have their populations been in recent years? Are they stable? Are they going down? Are they going uh, up? They're kind of holding their own now. They probably reached their peak, I think about 1949. We estimate we maybe harvested 150,000 birds back then. But since that time, due to habitat loss, um, now we're lucky if we harvest maybe five to 15,000 birds a year. 
um, not only that's decline is due to the loss of habitat and lower populations, but also we just have smaller, fewer small game hunters out there than we used to. Um, so, but at this point, I'd say they're holding their own. They seem to be doing better in northwestern Minnesota. Um, that part of the state has benefited from having more CRP grasslands mm -hmm. than we do in our part of the state. Um, but we really need to continue to work hard to maintain the open habitat that we have out there or, or we'll slowly continue to lose them. I know I've been reading about this lately. The, uh, the CRP is dwindling. Uh, at corn at $6 a bushel, so many farmers are going back into taking that land out of CRP. Mm -hmm. And I know in South Dakota and North Dakota, habitat for birds is shrinking fast. It's kind of a perfect storm. Uh, mm -hmm. Prices are high, and it's encouraging people to go back into, uh, you know, managing that. Yeah. So when you get people that contact you, is it usually from areas that are probably aren't the best agricultural areas, or, um, or is it both? Well, the part of the state that I work in, right, there's not a whole lot of ag. It's mostly recreational landowners that own land for hunting or just their outdoor enjoyment that contact me. And... Um, you know, so then I will I will have a, a look at their land, visit with them, what, what their goals are, and, and we'll kind of come up with a with a plan on how they can best manage it, um, whether it might be through prescribed burning, brushland mowing, shearing. I think we do have a few photos of those if you wanted to see them. How about size? Well, maybe while they're looking for those, um, you know, a rough grouse is a pretty small bird. Mm -hmm. They look big when they're all feathered out. Yep. Here, here's a little shot you wanted okay. to talk about maybe. But. Yeah, oh, here's my favorite mower, guys. <laughs> this is a good good picture of uh, we were, were mowing a bog with scattered spruce and tamarack in it, and it had become too, um, too treed for the birds to use, so we were opening it back up with mowing. And here's another mowing picture. This case here was mostly willow that was being mowed down. Now that's private land, isn't it? Yes, I focus on working on private land. So is there some sort of an incentive for the landowner to do this, or do they have to do this at their own expense? Um, they don't do it at their own expense. I mean, they sure can if they want to, but I am able to help them find funding sources. And one of our key partners and funding sources is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, through the Farm Bill, there are conservation programs available. Um, a couple that I use are, we call them WIP for the Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program and EQIP, which stands for the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Through those programs, landowners can sign up. If their application is approved, they get a contract and they'll get funding to do the burning, the mowing, the shearing, whatever is needed, tree removal to keep the habitat suitable. So when they contact you, you're the one that actually helps them make a plan mm -hmm. for how they're going to actually prepare this land. Are there benefits yeah. for other wildlife when you do something for sharp tail? Definitely, definitely. We like to consider the sharp-tailed grouse um, kind of a flagship species for other brushland wildlife or, or an indicator or maybe umbrella species. If sharp-tailed grouse populations are doing well in an area because they need a very large home range, the chances are that if they're doing well, that all the other wildlife that use similar habitat are going to do well too. Um, sharp-tailed grouse, you know, they need the dancing ground that you saw in the video, and then they will nest within a half mile to a mile out, and then the broods will range out you know, a little further, and then in the winter, they'll even range out several miles in search of food. So to sustain a population, you ideally need, say for one subpopulation, 10,000 acres of open complex. So within there, you're still gonna have great habitat also for things such as sandhill cranes, Northern Harriers, Shortered Owls, um, Moose. You, you moose? Know, yep, Moose. <laughs> um, the, there's a, in fact, was it 250 different species in Minnesota that also use brushland wow. habitat. So brush is important, isn't it? Yes. And I, I think we often think of it as just being in the way of other things, but mm -hmm. when you look at the habitat that it creates for wildlife, it's pretty phenomenal. Yes. Often people will drive by a brushland and just think, well, what is that good for? Um, but really, if you learn about it and understand them, uh, they're very important too. Now, typically, if a landowner went through all this to get the land prepared for sharp tail, do they typically allow people to hunt the land, or how does that usually work? Oh, it just depends on the landowner. Some people prefer to keep the hunting just for themselves, and others might allow you know, friends and relatives to hunt it. 
So it's like any other parcel of land, yeah. basically. Yeah. And what do these birds weigh? Uh, just two to three pounds. But they are bigger than a rough grouse, then, aren't they? Um, just a little. Yeah. Just a little. Yeah. And are they when there's a hunting season? I I have no idea about this, but do they? Can you hunt both males and females? Uh, yes, you can. Yep. Um, generally, the uh, the bag limit is three, with the possession of six. And you can hunt them from mid-September when small game season begins until the end of November. And how big are the broods, typically? Uh, they usually lay like 10 to 14 eggs, which they incubate for 23 days. So um, depending on how successful the hen is at getting her, her clutch off, you know, she could have up to, to 14 young. When they're young, uh, they are susceptible to, to weather, to predation. That's probably the toughest period of their life is... You know, that, that age is when they're a chick or learning to fly. And then when they're about 10 days old, they're already learning to fly a bit. And about 8 to 10 weeks, they'll resemble an adult grouse, a grouse would be that flying fast. very well. Yep. And what's their lifespan usually? Uh, probably maybe just two to three years. Wow. They don't live very long. Wow. Yeah, it's a tough life. <laughs> and and what, are the, what are the predators? What, what are their main predators that are usually after them? Well, on the nest, you'd have, you know, like a lot of ground nesting birds, there would be concerns with, uh, you know, fox, skunks getting into nests. Uh, and then there's avian predators, too. Uh, that's one reason we try to maintain the habitats is very open. Because um, if you have a lot of trees, they're perches for, for hawks, falcons, eagles, which can be predators on them. Um, so just, just similar to, to other ground nesting birds. Do they let you get very close to them, or are they just like any other grouse when they see you, they're gone? They're usually gone, yeah. You don't, can't usually get too close unless um, the males on the dancing ground, sometimes they can get so intent on what they're doing, or sometimes they'll even dance on a road. People have been able to drive right oh, up, really? and, and they'll try to attack their car. <laughs> oh, really? They're like a buck so, in a rut. So. Yeah, they're not thinking <laughs> real good that time of year. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, you have a partner in this project, or you have an organization that you work with, and I know you'd like to just mention them a little bit. So yeah, what well, is this organization? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got to mention my friends with the Sharp-Tailed Grouse Society here. Um, they're very important partners. We, we have a lot of partners that help with brushland projects. Um, but this, this group is especially dedicated. Um, it's a group of people that are hunters and non-hunters, and they're very dedicated to restoring and improving habitat. Yeah, this is a picture of one of their brush cutting days. Mid-March of every year, we get the whole group, whoever will come, often a lot of great college students, even college kids here from CLC and Brainerd and, and up at Ely and all over will come and help out. And what we do is everybody gets a brush off and we'll head out to a site with just scattered, say, trees that are enroaching upon the brushland often a site with scattered spruce or tamarack, and we'll just spend the day cutting trees down. You would not believe um, how much air you can affect when you get a, 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 har a hearty crew like that together. It's really fun. We'll start the day with a breakfast that the sharp Tail Grouse Society will provide, and then we'll go out and enjoy some camaraderie and brush cutting, and then we have what we call bog burgers. We grill burgers outside in the bog, <laughs> and then we work a little more. Um, but that's just one thing they do. They, they do their annual brush cut. The next one, if people are interested, is March 3rd. Is this a Minnesota organization, or is it, it a is. national organization? Um, nope, it's just a Minnesota organization. And where are they headquartered out of? We have members all over the state. Um, we don't really have headquartered out of anywhere. It's, it's all volunteer. Uh, we have a board that meets, you know, every few months. And where do they meet? Are they? In we the... we often meet over in Cloquet. Okay. But we do move the meetings around the state. They do. Yep. But they also have help with habit, larger habitat projects um, and land protection and acquisition projects. So they're, they're very active but always looking for new members. And if people are interested, they can go to their website at www.sharptails.org. So they function, I would say, similar to like Pheasants Forever and mm -hmm. some of those organizations to at least yeah. help the populations maintain. Do yep. you have any connection with the legacy monies that are coming through the legislature? Have you ever been involved with that for this organization? Yes, yeah, yep. Okay. In fact, we are, are using some of that funding to protect some brushland parcels in east central Minnesota. We've been very fortunate to uh, have been successful 
and getting like one and a half million dollars for an acquisition in northeastern Connecticut County. And now we're hoping to get additional fundings approved by the legislature this session for um, some more projects in Connecticut and, and hopefully in Aiken County too. Now, in some of these areas where you're working, do you have prairie chickens in some of the same areas? Nope. Um, you know, the closest prairie chickens are going to be, you know, out in western Minnesota. Once in a great while, we'll hear a rumor of, of a prairie chicken that may show up in one of our areas. Um, I haven't found or seen one yet. But out in the Glacial Ridge area of western Minnesota is, is where you'll typically find prairie chickens regularly. So they're very, very much confined to a certain areas and don't cross over and compete with each other well, typically. It, well, they do <clears throat> cross over in northwestern mm. Minnesota. You'll find prairie chickens and sharp tills in the same areas there where there's suitable habitat. But in east central Minnesota, it's just not open enough for prairie chickens. Okay. Now, I know you're out working in the field today. What's your typical day like when, you, when you're doing something this time of year? I mean, I'm yeah. guessing usually... You're waiting for 15 to 20 below, which is what it is now. <laughs> yeah, today today was just awesome. I couldn't have asked for a better today. Um, some days I am in the office. Uh, projects do take a lot of paperwork, planning, and coordination. But today was a, a very great day. I was out in the field um, most of the day. I was able to go to some of our brushland mowing projects. Um, and uh, we recently had about 130 acres mowed out on four private landowner sites in Aiken County. And uh, check those, GPS them, see how many acres we did, and then went to another site to assess it for a future project. Now, do you, do you typically see birds when you're out in the field? Not a whole lot. Once in a while. Um, in the spring when I'm doing surveys, the sharp tail growth surveys that I assist with, then I get to see a lot of birds. But usually when I'm doing the habitat projects, I don't, I don't flush them up too often. So... That, that must make it kind of challenging. I know, I know I've had friends who have done research on rough grouse, mm -hmm. and they would find drumming logs mm -hmm. and develop a technique where they could get up close to that. But when, you know, like the typical person walking outside isn't running across these birds, it must take some skill to actually find out where these birds are hanging out. Yes. And how do you determine in the spring where they're going to do their dance areas? Do they have yeah. typical dance areas? It's a good question. They... They do traditionally, as long as the habitat stays suitable, use the same dancing ground year after year. And, and that's why it's so important to do the surveys that we do in the spring because we're able to, to document where the birds are at, how many of the birds are using that dancing ground so we can get ideas of population trend changes, um, find out what habitats they're using, and, and know where to focus our work at. It's very important to do those surveys. Do they have swings in their populations like uh, like rough grouse do, where there's just some natural swings? At least we think, maybe they're yeah. rethinking that a little bit, but, you know, it seems like they have periods they, where they're up yes. and down. It, it's not as extreme as rough grouse, but they do sort of have a bit of a cycle also. Is this, is, is this dark meat? Pretty dark meat if you... Uh, um, it, it is, yep. yeah. Is it is it pretty mild? Um, I don't know. I guess I... I don't you're know, not, wouldn't know how to describe it. Well, <laughs> I eat ducks, I eat everything. It all tastes like liver, and I like liver. So <laughs> <laughs> it all tastes the same to me. <laughs> I, I think the neat thing about a sharp-tailed grouse, though, is that they're such a magnificent-looking bird mm -hmm. that if people aren't interested in hunting, mm -hmm. they can still be looking at these birds from just an environmental point of view and from a, a natural beauty point of view because they are mm -hmm. such a gorgeous-looking bird. They are a very unique bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else you'd like us to know about what you do, how you can people maybe, how can people get involved with what you're doing? Sure. Um, if people are interested in, in learning more about what they can do for sharp tail grouse, they can contact me at the Aiken DNR office. And uh, you can also go to our, our DNR website at uh, www.mndnr.gov. And on there, you can search for our private land programs webpage and uh, find information on myself and where I work and two other private land specialists in the state that focus on Habitat 2 for landowners. Are you finding that it's pretty easy to get people in, in enrolled in this kind of a program? Yeah, it usually is. I have no lack of work to do. I keep very busy. And generally when I assist people um, in signing up for the WIP and EQIP programs that I mentioned, most of the time they are successful in securing funding and seeing their project through, which is very rewarding. Uh, yeah, I bet that is. And if you uh, 
contacted you now, how long would it be typically before you would actually be able to come out and talk to someone? Mm, it usually takes, you know, at least a few weeks or maybe a month. Like right now, if somebody contacted me, I would probably have to say, oh, I'll try to get there like late January. And is there any size limit on land? Or do you want someone that has 100 acres or 5 acres? Oh, or? yeah. Um, the, big, the big projects, of course, are going to have a greater positive impact. But, you know, even small projects can make a difference, too. Uh, for example, if I were to just work with a landowner to remove a strip of trees uh, that had grown up along a ditch or an old fence line, Although that might just be a couple acres, it can still really make a difference in connecting up the habitat. Sharptail need an, an open vista, and so you want to try to remove that visual barrier in, in the purchase for predators. So even just a couple acres can make a difference. But we do have loaner, landowners where we will do prescribed burns that cover a few hundred acres. Do they have disease problems? Are they pretty healthy? Uh, I'm not aware of any disease problems. No. Nope. They're a pretty healthy bird. That's good to hear. As far as I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we've been talking tonight about the Dance for the Firebird, sharp tailed grouse, uh, so named after by um, Native American Indians because of the color of these birds. And there's, there's our last picture there. That, would, I guess, is a hen, isn't it? Uh, well, it's probably a male dancing. Okay. You just don't see you just don't see the, it's front the on. color. Yep, and, and not called the firebird because of really the color, but more of the habitats that they need. Wildfire was very important in maintaining the open habitats. Cool. Yep. Well, we've been talking with Jody Provost, who is out of the Aiken office. Jody, thank you very much for coming on board and talking to us about this beautiful bird, and hopefully it's helped people understand a little bit more about what that bird is. Thank you for having me. You bet. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.